Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2011 Covey Lecture Series. This is number six in our uh, in our series, and uh, I have uh, the very great pleasure of introducing Jim Wilworth uh, to speak to you today. Uh, Jim was born and raised in the Niagara Peninsula, um, and of course, always had an interest in uh, plants and agriculture. He did leave us for St. Mary's to do his Bachelor of Science and uh, graduated in 2001, but of course at that point, within days, I'm sure, headed back to, uh, to the Niagara Peninsula, uh, where he was immediately attracted to the, to the grape and wine industry. He completed the certificate program in grape and wine technology here at Covey at Brock University in 2004 and began working in the, in the vineyards in Niagara prior, prior to starting his graduate program under the supervision of Dr. Andy Reynolds here in Covey. His PhD research is focused on the understanding of Riesling terroir through, throughout the Niagara Peninsula, and he's expecting to defend very soon, right, Jim? Very soon. Yeah. Weeks, not months. Weeks. That's excellent. Um, he previously worked as the Quality Services Sensory Coordinator at the LCBO. Uh, before starting his position here at Covey as the senior staff scientist in viticulture uh, in July of 2010, so we're very pleased that he came back to um, came back to the fold and to Covey his position. Here is 50% outreach for the grape wine industry and 50% research. He's actively involved in a number of outreach activities as well as research projects, primarily focused on grapevine cold hardiness. Please join me in welcoming Jim Wilworth, where he's going to give us a talk on the state of the mines. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and I, uh, it's nice to see a good turnout here in the room, and uh, I welcome those of you uh, watching uh, via webcast and, and, uh, and whatnot. So when I was uh, approached to speak uh, here at the Covey Lecture Series, first I was uh, very excited because uh, this is a really interesting uh, lecture series that's nice to be a part of. But when I found out what time of the year my talk was going to be on, and given what my research is focused in on, cold hardness of grapevines, what I decided to do was have a talk that was, uh, was relevant to the period of, of time that we're at. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, about some of the processes of cold hardiness and the physiology about it just to kind of uh, connect the dots and, and to, to see how we got to where we are right now uh, in the vineyard. And then I would like to also uh, just give the state of the vine. What is the current status in, uh, in Ontario in terms of uh, what state the vines are at and uh, what we can expect from here to, uh, to the growing season and to, uh, and to bud break. So with any, any further ado, I'm going to get started here. So a lot of the focus right now at, uh, at, for research here at, at Covey, is, is, especially on the viticulture side, is looking at grapevine cold hardiness. And uh, one of the major impacts of, of, of growing grapes in, in uh, northeastern North America, everywhere in Canada, is that we grow a lot of the noble wine grapes, and they're not cold, uh, cold hardy. And so winter injury is our greatest threat. Uh, every year we're at risk and you know it's with uh, with some sadness and regret to say that in every region of Ontario right now we've experienced some degree of winter injury so we're, we never escape this it is it is uh, it is the greatest threat to success and it is cold hardiness is one of the limiting factors uh, especially because we do grow a lot of the vinifera cultivars or even some of, or even the hybrid cultivars and that this is the limiting factor for growing many of these grapes so for a lot of the research, we're trying to understand the most important factors for our climate in terms of uh, what's impacting cold hardiness, and also trying to optimize cold hardiness to deal with winter, with the cold winters that we have, and also the weather fluctuations that we have during the acclimation period and the deacclimation period. Now I'm going to go into some depth about uh, the processes of acclimation and deacclimation. And in a year such as this one, we're in one of these El Nino years, and we get a lot of spikes and, uh, and fluctuations in the weather, and this does have a huge impact in a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of ramifications in terms of uh, what can happen during these these periods of when the vines are getting cold hardy and coming out of uh, the cold hardy state. And obviously, climate change can have an impact on this and have more of these fluctuations. 
So some of the objectives of the, what we're doing here at, at, at Covey is uh, to monitor grapevine cold hardiness and to create uh, a web-based database. And we've done this in terms of Vine Alert. And I will show you some of the data from, uh, from this website. It's basically a, a go-to place where all of the cold hardiness information is stored. And uh, we like to further understand how to maximize the cold hardiness. We're not going to change the grapes per se. We want to make sure that those grapes are in the best possible state they're in going into the winters. And look at some of the vineyard management practices and decisions and their impact on, on cold hardiness. And understand what are the most critical factors involved. And at the end of, of, uh, of this work, which hopefully continues for a while, establish a grapevine cold hardiness best practices guide for our area. Niagara, Ontario, Canada, it's just a, a unique uh, growing uh, conditions that are, that are unique to us. And uh, what works here might not work other places. And what works other places might not work here. So we want to establish what's the best uh, practices guide for us. So here's some examples of, of uh, bud and tissue damage uh, due to freeze injury. And uh, like I mentioned, we've seen all of this this year. Uh, just to put it in perspective, if you see green, that's always a good sign. Brown is, uh, is bad. So in this case, this is a compound bud, and we have the primary bud here, the secondary, and the tertiary. And you can see that these are all alive, all 100%. In this case, we have cold injury. You see the browning of the tissue. These have been damaged uh, uh, due to cold conditions. In this case, there's a little bit of phloem damage here, but for the most part, um, the, the, the tissues are alive in this cross section of a cane. But in this case, you see a lot of browning. And even the xylem here is, is, uh, is brown, so this is uh, very severe cold, uh, cold damage. And uh, I actually saw some of this this year in above, above ground vinifera in Prince Edward County after uh, negative 35 degree Celsius weather. Uh, fortunately, they bury the vines and they had a good protection of snow as well. Um, but anything above ground, in terms of some of the sensitive vinifera cultivars basically looked like that. Not completely brown, but there was uh, definitely some sections of brown even in the xylem. Some of the other things that we could see in terms of winter injury, and this is, again, common things that we see uh, uh, around, uh, around here, is this is uh, last year some, uh, some cane splitting, or some, sorry, some trunk splitting that's occurred due to winter injury. Oops. And also, some other uh, uh, cumulative injury. This is actually a Riesling vine, and last year, there, all over Ontario, we found that there were these uh, these dead arms, and this is uh, a lot of this is due to cumulative winter injury from from not one year, but probably multiple years of, of cold injury and or some flow damage where the buds were actually okay, uh, but then the, the tissue itself got got whacked and and uh, led to uh, lack of uh, lack of push uh, after after bud break. So when we talk about cold hardiness, basically we're talking about the ability of, of a plant, the ability of the tissue to, to survive uh, freezing conditions. It is limited by its genetic potential and also by environmental conditions. So a grape variety, just by its genetics, can only get as hardy as, 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 it's, as it can be. So in terms of uh, some of the uh, native varieties around here, such as your, your riverbank grape, Vitus riparia, they can be hardy down to negative 40 Celsius, Fahrenheit, same thing. Whereas the, the, a lot of the wine grapes, in terms of the Vitus vinifera, are only hardy to about negative, uh, the mid-negative the mid 20s, negative 25 at, at their max. Um, other varieties, such or other culture, or, sorry, other species such as um, uh, muscadine in the southern part of the states, for example, they're only hardy to about negative 10 and 12 degrees Celsius. So just because they're uh, an American uh, species doesn't mean that they're, um, they're, they're as hardy. But the northern ones, such as riparia, are quite hardy. And like I mentioned before, it's also uh, cold hardiness is also influenced by the environment. And you can see here that it is a dynamic condition where it does change throughout the uh, dormant period. In an area where there's, there's warmer temperatures, the vines don't get as, as hardy as they would in a colder area. And this is uh, this upper uh, graph here is from uh, from vineyards in, or from vines in uh, Virginia. And this lower one are vines in New York. And you can see since the temperatures are colder in New York than Virginia, the, they, they, the vine can get closer to its genetic potential and its maximum hardiness. So there's a number of mechanisms that, that plants use to, to withstand freezing. 
And one of the ones that's specifically in buds uh, is, is this term called supercooling. And supercooling is a process by which the liquid remains uh, uh, a liquid below its normal freezing temperature. And I kind of use an example of ice wine here because as the, as the vines uh, dehydrate, and, or as the grapes dehydrate throughout the winter, uh, the less and less water, more and more solute, it does take a colder temperature to get those berries rock hard. So in November, per, per se, uh, you know, negative eight, it'll be, it'll be rock solid. Whereas later in the year, if you, if you get into a later harvest, you need colder temperatures to get those berries to be really, really hard. And it's kind of the same principle here, that during a freezing event, the water outside of the cell and the intercellular spaces and the cell walls, the, the water there doesn't have as much solutes as inside the cell. And so it will freeze. It's a non-lethal event. It doesn't, it doesn't actually kill the cell. But what happens is the osmotic potential goes down and water is pulled from the cell outside the cell. And so this increases the amount of solute, the solute concentration within the cell. What this does is it actually lowers the freezing point. Think of your antifreeze, or think of salt water. Salt water has a lower freezing point than, than uh, fresh water, for example. And then after this thawing occurs, after this freeze event, the, extra, the, the water in the intercellular spaces and whatnot thaws, the water basically just can diffuse back into the cell. So some of the causes of cell death, really, are one of the major causes of cell death is actually dehydration. Basically, so much water is getting sucked out of that cell that it eventually causes the cell to, uh, to, to die because of physical stress, stress on the, uh, on the membranes, and, and whatnot. This is a good example of just uh, ice on the outside of the cell. Just see how it's shrunk the cell and changed its whole shape. The other problem is when you have very high solute concentrations, so when a lot of that water has left the cell, it can actually become toxic to the cell. Solutes can precipitate within the cell, and these are all these can all uh, cause the cell to die. Also, changes in pH enzymes, as you know, are very uh, pH dependent. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the reactions and whatnot that occur within the cell uh, are, are they cease because of this change in pH, and it can again be a lethal. Uh, lethal because of that. Now when there is intracellular freezing, so when the cell itself actually freezes internally, it's always a lethal event. It's catastrophic. Uh, there's different compartments within the cell. They become ruptured and because of this physical damage and further dehydration, the cell dies. And um, also another thing is it's, uh, proteins become denatured and what have you. So if multiple cells die, then the tissue dies in the, in the, in the their organ uh, damage or death. In terms of tissues and buds, they do have a different uh, degree of, of cold sensitivities. Um, buds and roots are the most sensitive, and in terms of buds, since it is a compound bud, the primary buds are the most sensitive, followed by the secondary and the tertiaries. Unfortunately, the primary buds are the ones that really carry the, the fruit, or really uh, are responsible for the fruit for the next year, and, and the primary growth. Uh, next in line is phloem, then, then some of the xylem are, are, are the most hardy. So like I mentioned before, cold hardiness is a dynamic condition. So it's not a static straight line. As soon as the vines lose their leaves, they're not at the same state of hardiness. It, it, is, it does go through three different periods. Uh, there's a period of acclimation where the vines are moving from a cold tender to a cold hardy state. The coldest periods of the year uh, are, are or during the dormant period, or when they're at their maximum hardiness. And then following uh, this maximum hardiness period, when the temperature starts to increase, um, we will see this deacclimation period. I'm going to explain each one of these uh, in some detail. So right now, we're in this, we're just at this deacclimation uh, phase right here. So in terms of, in terms of dormancy, dormancy is, uh, if you're going to define it, it's suspension of visible growth. Obviously, the vine's alive. Um, it may not have leaves on it, but it is, uh, it is very functional. And this dormancy is induced by both the environment, so lower temperatures, uh, daylight, photo period, but also endogenous signals, so hormones and things like this are controlling uh, dormancy, or induced dormancy, I should say. 
Now the first period of dormancy is considered, it's called endodormancy. And this is regulated by physiological factors. At this point, no matter what you do, the vine is, is, is dormant, and it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to break dormancy. It needs to fulfill a number of, of uh, requirements within the plant for it to break dormancy. So if after the vines would lose their leaves, let's say in November, I would bring the vine inside, warm it up, I wouldn't be able to get it to break, break dormancy. But after a number of chilling requirements uh, for vinifera, uh, let's say it's, uh, it's around 100 to 500 hours, depending on, on what it is, um, after they uh, achieve these chilling requirements, then they can break dormancy. But in many cases, uh, especially uh, what we'll find is this period of echo dormancy. So here, the vines are still dormant because the environment is not suitable yet to, for bug break. So what's really holding the vines dormant right now is the lower temperatures. So like I mentioned before, acclimation is, a, is uh, moving from a cold tenor to a cold hardy state. And it is complex in nature. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of factors and processes uh, involved. And this is why it's not so easy just to pick one gene and that's going to, uh, to all of a sudden uh, make a, a vine or a plant cold hardy. It's, it's very complex, there's a lot of things going on. So what are some of these things happening? There's changes in gene expression. Certain uh, genes are up, are upregulated during acclimation. There's chemical changes, uh, such as uh, sugars being, uh, uh, or starches converted to sugars, sugars, more complex sugars being uh, synthesized. There's a lot of compositional changes and physical changes, especially in the membrane. Um, like I mentioned before, when a cell is uh, uh, being, uh, when the cell's shrinking and whatnot because of a freeze event, uh, it, very important compositional changes have to occur so that it doesn't uh, to be try to resist these freezes. A lot of hormones are, are hormonal changes are, are occur, uh, specifically abscisic acid or ABA. If you know uh, anything about ABA, it's uh, it's involved a lot with uh, with drought and uh, water regulation in plants. And water is an enemy. Free water is an enemy in terms of vines and and plants in general in terms of uh, cold, cold uh, sensitivity. So it's a very important home hormone. Um, other hormones that are involved in uh, the growth of the vine, such as your cytokinins, auxins, gibberellins, they, they're, uh, they're, they're not uh, active uh, at this point in time. And there was a talk uh, a couple months ago um, here at uh, part of the lecture series, and um, they're talking about different uh, cold hardiness genes that are involved. In these are just uh, three uh, family of genes that are, that are involved in, in cold hardiness, that have been identified to be involved in cold hardiness. There's a lot going on. So in Vitus vinifera specifically, because uh, Vitus riparia might be, is a little bit different in terms of acclimation, the first period, the first step of acclimation is, is induced by cool temperatures, but temperatures that are above freezing, as well as, as, well as shorter days. Whereas uh, uh, Vitus riparia, for example, can acclimation can be reduced just by shorter days. The second part of acclimation, this is where the vines actually become more cold uh, tolerant and, and, acclim and, and acclimate more to the cold, is induced by these below freezing temperatures. And the maximum hardiness is achieved during the coldest periods. And it is a cumulative process. So this is an important point I want to make, is that it can be stopped, reversed, or restart it, and it, that's all dependent, in rec, or dependent on temperature fluctuations. So if we have a warm period, the, the acclimation can actually reverse a bit, but then it can restart once we have some cooler temperatures again. It's not uh, a constant smooth curve like I showed you in that, uh, just, that's just a pretty graph just to demonstrate uh, uh, cold hardness, but um, in general it's, it's more of these bumps, ups and downs, and I'll show you some of that. So what are some of the processes of acclimation? One of the first things, and this, and this actually begins in August, um, when, when you're, everyone is still cons looking at fruit quality and veraison and things like this, what's actually happening is the vines are starting to get ready for winter. They're starting to acclimate. And one of the first visual signs that you can see is actually perigrum formation. So when you have the green shoots and you start seeing the, the bark form, that's actually uh, one of the signs of uh, of acclimation. And it's associated with, with uh, rapid uh, 
mobilization of, of carbohydrates and nutrients to, to the trunks, uh, to the canes, and to the roots, to the permanent organs of the vine. And, um, and, and again, this is storage, hidden the, the carbohydrate reserves for, for winter. And it, is, it does happen soon after veraison. So as much as we want the fruit to continue to mature and whatnot, the vines are actually thinking, well, let's get ready for winter. And so they start mobilizing the, these carbohydrates and nutrients to the, to, the, to the actual permanent organs and not so much the fruit. And this can be you know, a pain in the neck to the winemaker because the, the, the fruit isn't maturing as, as quickly because it's not so much the primary sink anymore. The per primary sinks are now with the, the trunks and the canes and the roots. Because survival is the number one um, goal of the, of the plant, not so much uh, superior wine, unfortunately. One of the most important things is decline of water content. And like I mentioned, if cysic acid uh, and, and things that's regulating water, and, and, and de there's dehydration in many, of the, uh, in many of the tissues, and this is critical, because lots of water in the, in the plant and in the tissues and the cells is, it has a negative impact. What also happens is there's plugs in the system that occur where the buds will become isolated from the canes and the trunks through a bare, bare zone. And uh, again, this is trying to limit uh, uh, water and, and whatnot from entering into the, uh, these organs. Again, buds are trying to super cool, so sugars and organic solutes are moving into, these, uh, into the buds, and the cells are continuing to, to dehydrate and membrane stabilizing. And as the temperature gets colder, there is more redistribution of water within the buds and, and tissues and further desiccation. So like I have there, free water is bad news. Any free water can freeze readily and can cause, can cause injury at any time. So here's probably one of the most popular uh, slides that you'll see when we're talking about cold hardness, but it does such a great job. So it's, uh, Basically showing about parietal formation and where it starts, it starts at the basal end of the, of the shoot and it moves, it moves upward. Uh, and what you, what you find is as parietal starts forming, you have the ability to supercool. Without parietal, there's no supercooling. Parietal uh, limits external water uh, on the, from the shoot and, and it cannot supercool if it doesn't have that, that parietal uh, layer. As we move, we get more deep supercooling, at, again, at, at the basal end of the chute, and then and the parietal formation is moving uh, along the chute to the point where in late September, or late October, I should say, we have a lot of deep supercooling on the chute, but at the end, we still have the weak or no supercooling. There's no parietal formation. Think of uh, Sauvignon Blanc is always a good example of when you're on the vineyard and you see Sauvignon Blanc. And you see at the end of the year, you see a lot of green, green uh, shoots at the end. And what happens? Even end of, end of November, December, you see the ends, are, they're, they've already died back. They don't have any, any uh, 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 cold tolerance, really. And so it's just basically the vine self pruning itself. Now, so if you look at hardiness of, of buds moving from from the base to the tip. You can see here that there's a, a, a range in, in cold hardness. So within one, sh one shoot itself, see about two degrees uh, difference from this deep super cold area to less super cold, less hardy uh, apical end of the, of the shoot. Now, when we're, like, when we're talking about super cooling and resisting freeze injury, there's, the vine has a lot of different uh, protectant set that it, that it ha has at its disposal to protect the vine from, uh, from freezing. Now, they, these, these uh, cryoprotectants, as I'll call them, are used to depress the freezing, but also involved with stabilizing the membrane because there's a, there is stress on the cell. So these are used to, to reduce dehydration and also inhibit ice crystals. So think about when you go to the mechanic and they test your energy. And so they say, well, it's, it's only good to negative 8 degrees Celsius. So you have to get either add concentrated antifreeze to it or get your coolant changed. Well, the vine the same, is the same kind of boat. It, need, it ha uses all these different uh, sugars, such as um, sucrose, uh, glucose, and fructose, which it's converted from starch to sugar. 
but also some of these more complex uh, legosaccharides that are, that are associated with, with uh, deeper cold hardiness. And research has found that these, uh, these RFO uh, sugars are, uh, are staphylococcus and raffinose are associated with a different, uh, the, higher concentrations when the vine is more cold hardy. So again, these are acting like your, your typical antifreeze. There's also proteins involved. These are glycoproteins. And they act as an antifreeze, like I mentioned earlier. But they also reinforce, reinforce the cell walls and can help with integrity. And there's all, these are also the dehydrins. There's free amino acids, uh, proline, arginine, and others. They're not really sure what their, what their main purpose is, but part of it is to stabilize membranes in, in the proteins themselves because these, there's protein uh, conformational changes that occur. And also the, the membrane, there's lipid compositional changes as well that, are, that occur to, again, stabilize the, the cell in the, uh, in the membrane. So that is the, the part where the vines are moving from a, a cold hardy to a cold tender and then state. And then once we reach this period here where the vine has reached their chilling requirements and the temperatures start to rise, we hit this, uh, the vines start uh, hitting the stage of, of deacclimation. Now deacclimation, basically people just call it uh, the reciprocal of acclimation and really don't discuss it in too, too, too much detail. And we've been asking ourselves, uh, you know, a lot of questions recently about uh, just what's happening for deacclimation. So I want to give a, a little bit of a background on deacclimation and what to expect, and uh, and uh, just what what are some of the factors driving this. But in general, it's, it is the reciprocal acclimation in many ways. When the temperatures do start to increase, uh, sugars are now uh, or the, the period where starches were being converted to sugars. Now sugars will start to, uh, to be converted to starch. Starch can accumulate. But also the vine, its, it's, it's reserves have been depleted. It needs some energy. And it, what it will actually do is it metabolize uh, some of these carbohydrates that, that synthesize them in, 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 uh, during acclimation. Again, it will um, different uh, uh, concentrations of the antifreeze proteins will decline. And the proteins will, again, change their conformation and, as well as the lipids. The other thing that happens is there is more rehydration in the vine. So there is more water, free water presence. It's not all bound up by proteins and, and whatnot. So it is becoming less hardy because of that. Now, deacclimation is much more, rap much more rapid than acclimation. Acclimation takes weeks to months. Like I mentioned, it starts in uh, the end of, end of August and you know, it moves on through to maximum hardiness, which is December, January, at least here. For deacclimation, it can be days to weeks. And what are, what are the possible reasons? Like I mentioned, deacclimation has a lot to do with the ambient temperature outside. But acclimation d does depend on a lot of energy. There are a lot of conformational changes, changes in structure, changes in function, genes are being upregulated, and it, this takes a lot of energy. Whereas a deacclimation, it's using a lot of a lot of the, the carbohydrates and proteins that are synthesized during acclimation are just being uh, metabolized, and so deacclimation can just be fueled by metabolism of these of these uh, compounds. Now, the extent and the rate of acclimation or deacclimation, I should say, that's not that's a typo. Uh, it does depend on the magnitude of the increase in temperature, but also the duration of the exposure to that temperature. So if you look at this graph here, for example, we do have these spikes in temperature here that occurred, uh, this is the, uh, last year's data. Um, and you can see here that with, with these minimum temperatures, even though they were, they were much higher, the vines didn't start to deacclimate there. But over a gradual period, of when, as, as temperatures generally rise, you see, the, you see a decrease in, in cold hardiness. And it's not a linear relationship, and there may be a lag phase. So just because you have a day or two of, of uh, warming temperatures doesn't mean you're going to get a huge increase in, in, uh, in deacclimation. Now it's not clear how uh, this temperature signal is transduced in the vine or how deacclimation is initiated or what day length has in, 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 this, uh, in this whole process. 
Um, it's basically, uh, you know, the circadian rhythms and things of this, it's, it's hypothesized that they do have a large impact, but to what extent, uh, research really hasn't shown. But my guess would be that it's ha there is some impact, because uh, photoperiod does have a huge impact in other, uh, in other crops, but uh, in terms of vines, we're not 100% uh, sure. So when we talk about a midwinter hardness, so vines that are more cold tolerant in the winter, does it equal better resistance to deacclimation? And the answer is it's not necessarily the case. It's not just because a vine is more cold hardy uh, doesn't mean that come March, April, it's going to be in better shape. And I'll explain this in a minute. But for a particular cultivar, if we get if we optimize cold hardness, let's say in Chardonnay, and on March 1st, it's hardy to negative 22, even this is, I'm just using this as an example, it's in better shape than it would be if it was only hardy to negative 15. The rates of deacclimation might be the same, but we have a lower starting point. So that's advantageous to that, to be more, more cold tolerant. But what I'm saying about well, just because a vine has a deep midwinter hardiness doesn't mean that it's going to be resistant to deacclimation. Here's an example. Concord has been shown to be less hardy in the month of March than some of the vinifera cultivars. Stan Howell has shown this research with, uh, with Riesling and, uh, and Chardonnay and Concord. And I like this concept a lot. Here, uh, Kevin Kerr and, uh, and and uh, Bob Womp will talk about this, and it's this concept of early to bed, early to rise. Basically, if, 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 a, if a vine acclimates sooner, it, it, it fulfills its, its needs sooner, and it, and it can break dormancy earlier. So work that has just been done in terms of modeling some of this uh, uh, cold hardiness uh, LTE data and comparing it to climate uh, out of Washington, uh, so Marcus Keller, um, Lynn Mills, and colleagues have just published this in the Annals of Botany. And so uh, they've had 20 years of data and, and, and using uh, some complicated modeling. Have actually, we're looking at trying to uh, model rates of acclimation uh, and deacclimation to, uh, uh, yeah. And what they found was, there's are two examples. That Concord, for example, achieved great midwinter hardness. We know it's a, a very cold hardy uh, cultivar. But it also had the highest deacclimation rate. And it, so this resulted in a rapid loss of hardiness in the spring. Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, we know it's late as can be. It's one of the latest varieties we grow here. And it was the least hardy because of that. But because it went into dormancy and it acclimated later, it also maintained its hard, hardiness the latest and it had a lower deacclimation rate. So what's some of the significance of this? Particularly at this stage of, of our industry, we're starting to look at uh, other cultivars and certain, I'm talking not only Niagara, but uh, Prince Edward County, Quebec, and areas like this. And all through the Midwest uh, United States, one of the, some of the most important cultivars right now are some of these uh, Minnesota cultivars that are, have some riparian background in them. They may be cold hardy, but what are the impacts of some of these cultivars in terms of uh, things like this? If they mature earlier and they, they reach maturity, they acclimate sooner, you know, we, we might get, uh, there could be some troubles later on in the, in the season. It's just, uh, it's for consideration, I'm not sure exactly uh, if that would be the case, but it is something to, to consider because riparia uh, vines do uh, come out uh, of, of dormancy and deacclimate much quicker uh, than some of the other cultivars. And they're hardy to negative 40 at, uh, at their maximum uh, hardiness. The one thing that, that we've taken even from this, from this large study though is that deacclimation cannot be pr predicted by the midwinter hardiness. Basically, whatever, whatever temperatures we have in, this, in the late winter and the spring, that's really the driver for deacclimation. So then there's this concept of reacclimation and gaining hardiness back. So like I mentioned before, the plant is never static in terms of, in terms of its hardiness throughout the dormant period. And it does fluctuate. And here's an example here of just how the vine fluctuates. 
generally, you can have this nice smooth curve like I, I showed, but you do have these steps where they move up and down, up and down. And it does relate a lot of times to the temperature. Uh, you will see a bit of a lag here and there as well. But you can see here how the vine, um, here's a good example. Well, the vine was lose, or gained hardiness, then it, then it lost some hardiness, and then we had some cold periods, and it dropped down again, and so on. So you can see it does go up and down. So it can reacclimate. But as the vine moves, uh, as we move closer and closer to the spring, and there has been more and more temperature, uh, higher temperature exposures, the reacclimation does become more limited, and and we, it gets to a point basically where the loss of reacclimation cannot be, uh, or sorry, um, yeah, the loss of reacclimation um, may be simply due to the fact that changes have occurred, uh, developmental changes that are irreversible. The vine has basically gone to a point of no return, and no matter what we do. No matter what happens, even if we have some uh, long period of cold weather, they will not be able to reacclimate. And again, there's just an example of, of, of points where there has been some reacclimation, and generally, even though we're moving a, a general trend upwards, from after some periods of colder weather, they have it has gone down a bit and regained some hardiness. But here's some of the concerns about deacclimation: is that Fluctuations in the temperature, especially they're predicting that this year for, for Ontario, uh, Environment Canada, or sorry, all of Canada, Environment Canada has predicted that we're going to have uh, a lot more fluctuations in the, it's going to be colder spring and late winter, but it's, we're going to have a lot of these large fluctuations in temperature. So this is going to be bad because in the winter, you know, we're hardy to negative 22, for example. The fluctuations really don't, aren't going to make a difference in terms of, uh, in terms of the hardiness of the vine. Whereas here, they will have large consequences. If we have five, six days of warm weather, we can deacclimate quite a bit, and then all of a sudden we have a cold, huge cold snap. So this is a real dangerous time, and, 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 and historically a period of time where we do have a lot of, uh, we can't have a lot of winter injury. And it's just because the vines aren't as hardy as, as they once were. And like I said, we, they, the hardiness is restored at a slower rate. They don't, they don't uh, acclimate quite as, as well. And they never do make it back to where they once were. And then as spring approaches, we're closer to bud break, deacclimation can occur very, very quickly. We can lose many degrees of hardiness, even in a week. So when we're approaching bud break, one of the things that happens is the vine really starts to, to rehydrate. And when a vine is acclimated, it's, a lot of the tissues are, are, uh, only have about 45% water in them. But once buds swell and get to this woolly stage, they can gain up to 40% of the water back. Then with all that water, obviously you have that uh, huge potential for, for easier freeze and easier uh, injury at that point. So the vines at this point aren't very hardy at all. So one of the things that we're doing is testing cold hardiness. So we're tr we could track uh, how hardy the vines are through the different stages of, uh, of dormancy and, uh, and, and, and know the understand the acclimation, the maximum hardiness periods, and the deacclimation rates. And to do this, we're basically using, uh, we're using this uh, method called differential thermal analysis. And with this method, we have programmable freezers and we can simulate uh, cold events. We, uh, we drop the temperature from 4 degrees Celsius to uh, below negative 30 at a rate of uh, 4 degrees an hour. And we basically load the cells up with, uh, with, with tissue. And on these trays, what we're doing is we're measuring electrical conductivity across the plates. And so we can actually measure when, when the heat is released, when a freezing event occurs within, within the, the, uh, the tissue. So when we have an extracellular event, we have these things called exotherms. And this is a high temperature exotherm, which I know this is kind of small, but you have this large, this large uh, peak here. This peak is not uh, critical in terms of we want to see it because we know the equipment's working and, and whatnot. But what we really care about are these low temperature exotherms. 
These are when intracellular events are occurring within the body. So this is when the inside the cells are freezing. At this point, we can calculate how hardy the, the, the buds are or the, the cane tissue are. So it's, it's a, a useful method. It is rapid, uh, considering it's 13 hours a run, but that's uh, still considered uh, uh, pretty rapid in terms of calculating uh, hardiness. And we're monitoring throughout the whole period. So I mentioned before about this database called VinAlert. We launched this in 2010, of, of uh, November 2010. And it's free, available to the web. And it's basically a resource of data and information concerning cold hardiness uh, and winter injury for both growers and researchers. And it's, it's there to provide timely information, critical information to, to the industry. And at this point in time, we are at a stage where we're not really sure, you can't really guess where, where the vines are. In the midwinter, you can kind of get away with saying, oh yeah, they're, they're hardy to the max, we know that's going to be around below negative 20, so we're safe then. Well, right now, we're not really sure. We know that, we know that the vines are going to start to deacclimate. This is an example of, of how the data is displayed in Vine Alert. And this is data taken from a Chardonnay block in the Four Mile Creek Appalachian in, uh, in the Niagara Peninsula. Here are the low temperature uh, measurements from uh, temperatures from, from that vineyard. And this data right here are the low temperature exotherm 50. So this is the predicted temperatures at which 50% of the buds would be killed. And you can see from last year's data that the curve follows nicely with the general trends of, of, uh, of, of the ambient temperatures. And you find acclimated this point in time we're at the, the coldest periods of the year, thank goodness that we were also at maximum hardiness and this low temperature didn't exceed um, this LT value. But then as the temperatures increased, so did the, the hardiness of the vine. It, the hardiness of the vine decreased. So some of this year's questions are, where do we come from? How do we enter dormancy? Where are we at right now? Where are we gonna go? And how does this compare to other years? These are all the questions that uh, everyone wants to know and, and, and very, uh, very important questions. So here's an example of a smoothed out curves of, from, of hardiness data from the same vineyard for the last three years. And you can see this year is the green. I basically just uh, extrapolated that from the data uh, just uh, yesterday. So in the, in the green data here is, is this past year, so 2010-11 data. And you can see we entered uh, the acclimation period rapidly, and we entered, uh, so went deeper into hardiness earlier, and we reached maximum hardiness at an earlier date than the last couple of years. But similarly, when I'm talking about earlier, what I talked about earlier, about early to bed, early to rise, you can also see that we're, we're coming out of hardiness earlier too this year. That the, the vines are, are deacclimating sooner because they've, they've achieved their, what they needed to achieve earlier on. And all it's holding them right now back is the, is the ambient temperature. So, but compared to last year, we're basically at the exact same point in time as we were last year. But last year, if you, it was a colder, wetter year, and we didn't acclimate as well as we did this year. But we had that really warm spring, remember? It was a warmer spring. I remember magnolias blossoming here super, like, super early. I think it was the beginning of April, in, in the city at least, with the, around buildings and whatnot, and um, you can see that the vines also deacclimated quickly. Whereas in 2008 to 2009, it was a cooler, uh, cooler uh, spring and late winter, and they deacclimated at a slower rate. So we went in, we went in to the winter in very good shape, thank goodness, because we had a lot of cold events uh, at, at the end of, well, mid to end of January, but now we can expect that uh, we are going to come out a bit sooner. And this is just an example of, uh, 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 of just the same data, which is presented differently, of, last, of, of this year and last year. And you can see we're a little bit further ahead uh, this year than last year. Similarly, this is, uh, this is looking at some Sauvignon Blanc from a uh, different appellation. And you can see that uh, Sauvignon Blanc, was this, was this was taken in the middle of October. And it was already hardly a negative. Uh, it was, I think the actual value was negative 
And we have these warm periods here, and it's kind of a flat uh, section where not much happened. Uh, they didn't really acclimate, acclimate uh, too deeply over that period of time. But then once we had some colder temperatures, it dropped down. And uh, again, Sauvignon Blanc was down negative 20, uh, 24, 25 this year, which is probably, I'm sure, the maximum genetic potential for the maximum hardening Sauvignon Blanc. It was a good year for, for hardening off Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, that dry uh, fall we had uh, definitely was beneficial. And then now what we're starting to see, though, is some deacclimation. For some reason, Sauvignon Blanc doesn't, and Merlot, and I'm going to use these as examples, they don't seem to acclimate as well, they don't get as hardy, and they seem to deacclimate sooner. What we're finding is that Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc right now are deacclimating a bit sooner than some of the other cultivars. So it's kind of a lose lose situation, and I think that's part of the reason why we generally, and these, are, these are some of the most tender varieties that we have, and some of the most tender varieties just around. This, this uh, graph here is just basically a smoothed out graph of this, just to make it look prettier, just, to, just so you can visualize that we are moving uh, in the, in the uh, less hardy, uh, starting to become less hardy. Now similarly with, uh, this is with Chardonnay, and again, hardened off very well. We were at maximum hardness for a long period of time because we did have a lot of that cold weather, but now we're starting to see that the, that the vines are starting to deacclimate a bit. And LT10 values are now below negative 20. The LT50s are still, uh, are still below negative 20, but um, this was data taken uh, last week. Uh, I tried to have current data from yesterday and I had a problem with the freezers. So we do, like I said, these it's sensitive equipment and uh, just one little uh, blurb and uh, we, uh, I wasn't able to get some the latest information, but uh, I will. Ex I do expect that, especially if you have some warmer weather, that it probably is. I'm not saying it's up here, but it's probably uh, uh, starting to deacclimate more and more. So, what is this? What what can we expect? We can expect that as temperatures warm up, they will deacclimate, um, and the closer we do get to, to spring, the longer periods of time we have with warmer weather the tougher the vines are, they're, they're not going to recover as quick and they're going to deacclimate at a faster rate. So it's very important to keep monitoring um, cold hardiness through, through vinyl or through other sources. So it's just some final points here. I'm going to take this into two, uh, two different areas. One is as a researcher, just for cold hardiness and deacclimation and acclimation. What are, some, what are some key points? Basically, we need to further understand the factors involved in cold hardiness. And one of the things we're addressing right now are looking at cultural practices. And like I mentioned, it's looking at some of the best practices of, of how to maximize hardiness for different cultivars. As well as understanding the environmental cues in different growing seasons, different vintages. And from looking at some of those, uh, so, some of those charts and graphs I showed you, and further uh, go into the vineyards and explore the factors that are involved in, in terms of what is what is happening, what is causing these deacclimation, these acclimation rates. Through multidisciplinary research, look at some of the genes involved, and there are there, there are a lot of cold hardiness uh, breeding programs, molecular breeding programs going on at the moment. Also look at some of these uh, signal transduction pathways. So what are the impacts of light photoperiod having on, on acclimation, deacclimation? Hormones, what is really happening? Because we want to get to it, we want to be able to consistently, as researchers, provide information that we can consistently go from vines that look like this in the winter to vines like that. Full crop, healthy crop, and not, uh, not vines that look like that now in the winter and look like that in the spring. So as a grower, some final points is to continue to monitor hardiness throughout the dormant period particularly during the acclimation and deacclimation phases. If you're here and we have, or in Canada, we have the, the final website where we're showing hardiness from many different regions, uh, it's, it's a huge resource for, for people to, to be able to, uh, to see how cold hardy things are. We're trying our best to collect as many samples as often as we can to provide the best information to the industry. We are fortunate in Ontario that we have these arsenal of wind machines. I see some pioneers uh, 
sitting next to me here who have uh, really uh, moved the, pushed the envelope in terms of having these wind machines. And, and so there is a way to help mitigate cold injury, especially when they are uh, deacclimating and we do have these, these, uh, these, these risk factors. But with, these, with wind machines, this information is really, really important because it does um, provide when to turn them on, when they're useful, and so on. But obviously you have to monitor the environmental conditions in the forecast so you know what to do, know when, what's happening, and also understand the factors of how the vines went into the dormant period. Where, was it a heavy crop year? Was it a light crop year? Were the vines unhealthy going in? All of these factors come into play. Anything you can think of in the vineyard is going to impact cold hardiness. And just be prepared for, for, uh, for this time of year. And, um, and so that you are ready for, if, you, if, if need be, you can help probably help try to mitigate uh, any injury. And uh, in the words of Duke from G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle. <laughs> Providing some information that we're trying to do, at least there's some information to go by in terms of making informed decisions. For so many years, it was, it's, been, it's a guessing game, and deacclimation, for sure, is, the, is one of the things that's very hard to model and predict, because it has so much to do with the current temperatures. This is really what's driving um, uh, deacclimation. So I'd like to make some acknowledgments here to, to all the funding uh, agencies and, and co collaborators such as the GGO, uh, AFC, uh, WIN, Vapor and Wine Research Inc. Uh, KCMS has been involved with this project for a long time, uh, developing some of the freezer methods and, and working uh, uh, very hard on all of the regional sampling. And also uh, the people here at Brock, uh, Brock Electronics, Tom McDonald and Mike, uh, they've uh, unbelievable in terms of what they've done with these, uh, these freezers. Um, they're, like I said, they're very sensitive pieces of equipment and uh, we had the problem yesterday and they got up and going, the freezer's up and going already today. So it's, it's a huge resource to have them. Also the whole team at Covey and all of us involved in the Cold Hardness Project. It's not just me, it's a lot of people uh, involved with this project and there's a lot of work being done uh, to provide all this uh, information to you. Dwight's involved with uh, the Vinyl Alert website and uh, in developing all the, uh, the website for us and managing the help managing the website, as well as Natalie and Barb for outreach and uh, communications and, and all of the hard work that they do in terms of helping get the, the message across to everybody. So with that, that I'd like to thank you and uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, please ask questions. Jim, how do you think that harvest dates affect uh, activation basically, mm -hmm. in terms of timing when we pick with different grape varieties basically? Okay, so the question was how, how does harvest date impact acclimation and some of the different cultivars that, that uh, we have and, and how that impacts harvest date. One thing I could say about harvest date is I mentioned before about carbohydrates uh, moving from, so the photosynthate from the leaves are moving to the permanent organs of the vine. Uh, like your trunks and your canes, whatnot, and because of because that starts happening earlier on, that is part of the rationale why some studies have found that um, harvest date has not impacted acclimation, and that's one of the rationales why they think that that's why it's not the case because the vine starts getting ready earlier on in 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 April, or sorry in August uh, just after freeze-on. And, and so harvest date probably doesn't have as big of an impact as your crop levels. Overcropping in, in some of the studies out of Ohio, out of Washington State, uh, Virginia, um, they've all found that uh, overcropping has more of an impact than, than harvest date. But if a cultivar isn't suited for the climate, let's say you're not entering, the cultivar is not entering Verizon until very late in the season, and then we hit this big wall called winter, then uh, hang time does make a difference because it's not, if, if the grape isn't uh, maturing itself, then it's, it's not going to be very hard. So it can, it can be a problem growing, uh, growing some cultivars that, that really aren't suited. Um, some of the really, really late grape varieties, uh, I see George in the background there and uh, I just think of like a, some of the Greek varieties, for example, if we tried to grow those here, uh, they probably 
went to Chihuahua. I have a question from the webcast audience. Would you expect Burying vines would mitigate the deacclimation fluctuations. Better or worse for vines? Okay, the question was uh, basically talking about uh, burying vines and if it makes it better or worse for acclimation, deacclimation. Uh, when the soil, just like snow, has a lot of uh, insulation properties, um, which make which, which is beneficial for the for for a vine in terms of when it, when it has a maximum, really low temperatures. One of the drawbacks is though, if, it, if, if, a vine, if a vine is buried, it hasn't been exposed to as cold a temperature, so it's not going to be as hardy in the first place. If you unearth the vine earlier in the year, or I should say earlier in, like let's say March, April, and then you get cold snaps, it probably isn't going to be as cold hardy as something that's been exposed. As, as a cane or buds that have been exposed to the to the colder air uh, the entire time, um, it's this one thing about burying vines in snow. Yeah, it's fine when you have the vines protected in snow as long as you keep the snow there forever. As soon as you lose the snow, you lose that insulating care, those insulating properties, and the vines won't be as hardy. I've actually taken some measurements of of, uh, of buds under the snow and above the snow, and they were 10 degrees less hardy. Five to ten degrees less hardy in some cases, so it does have a huge amount of insulation uh, properties. And so, if if they're buried, it you know, probably try to wait a bit longer um, before uh, before I earth. But you can't wait too long. It's one of those you wait too long, then you end up with other problems. chosen to go with with the studies and do you see a time when you'll branch off into other varieties mm -hmm. of the study? <clears throat> so in terms of the uh, the regional sampling, we're focused on Chardonnay and Cabernet Franc, so the two most widely planted white and red cultivars, and we're testing these in all the Appalachians in Ontario, except for Pelee Island. Uh, and we're also looking at each sub-appalachian within the Niagara Peninsula. So those are the two uh, cultivars that we're testing uh, everywhere exclusively. And we've also added additional cultivars. Uh, some of them, again, popular, widely planted cultivars such as Riesling, um, Pinot Noir, but also some sensitive, um, some cultivars we know that are winter sensitive, such as uh, Syrah, uh, Merlot, and Sauvignon Blanc. And in those, for those cultivars, we're focusing on areas where there's a lot of uh, plantings of those cultivars. So, on top of the escarpment, we're really not planting or not uh, sampling anything really sensitive, but we want to make sure we're capturing the, the important varieties in important areas. In terms of expansion to other cultivars, um, really, it's a matter of time and resources and what and what the industry wants. Uh, if, if there's a need to, to be looking at some of the other cultivars, uh, we can. Um, but again, it's it's all logistics. Said the freezers right now are at a really full capacity. And uh, in terms of research, I've been looking at Viognier um, and some other and some other sensitive cultivars as well.